Okay, hello everyone. So Blackboard has eaten the recording of the original webinar. Uh, I've had an uh, incident report in with IT for a day or so and the deadline's coming up. Uh, that's not really a, a hard deadline so we can put it back a little bit. Uh, but if this has never happened before in the five years I've been doing this with webinars. So this is pretty unique and so probably we need to do something else. So uh, this is, uh, you know, fortunately I had the, uh, you know, slideshow and there wasn't that much student participation so I can probably just uh, re-record this and put this on uh, YouTube. So that's uh, stuff about the, oh, I have, you know, uh, transitions. Uh, I have stuff uh, you know in there about the uh, webinar but we'll get back to that. Uh, some student questions. The first question is in the classroom version of this class uh, diff does it differ from the current online version? Uh, well that it's online but uh, really it doesn't differ that much. The, the things that I you know think are really important in lecture uh, I usually put into discussion boards or webinars. For example, one of the things I definitely touch on is the critical incident technique in class. And so I have a uh, discussion board about it. Uh, so not really that different. Uh, it's, you know, the online version, of course, is more driven by the textbook, uh, but not that different. And the second question, oh, I need to get a pointer. Where's the, my pointers? No pointers here? What's going on? Yep. No pointers. Sorry, folks. Oh, you're going to... No, I'm sorry. I'm not doing it that way. Uh, you can see my pointer. Second question, can a person like me who has never really studied in the field before apply what I learned to my future work? Well, yes, of course. Uh, when I usually get asked that question, I usually refer students to Psych 251 Organizational Behavior. Uh, that course I uh, have designed to be more experientially based so that you're you know, learning how to act and how to lead in organizations. Uh, 251, that is our course here, it's a more technical course and it's more focused on industrial organizational psychology. And most of the work of IO psychologists is involved in, uh, you know, employment testing and employment and hiring and, uh, you know, fair employment and EEOC. So uh, that's what IO psych is and that's what I'm focusing on. But I'll tell you that those things definitely can be applied to the work environment uh, when you're doing things such as hiring, being concerned about you know, violating EEOC law and things like that. Someone asked if I'm interested in a career in I.O., where do I start? Well, I would suggest that you start with my two, uh, you know, two-part video on careers in I.O. psychology. And indeed, I looked up the data on YouTube and only nine people uh, from CUNY had watched the video this week. Uh, up at that point, so uh, probably people need to uh, make sure that you watch the videos, especially my video lectures. But uh, a more, uh, you know, uh, better answer is, as I said in the videos, uh, PSYOP has a really great student page, and I would recommend that you check it out. Uh, you know, uh, one of my students who is now a working I.O. psychologist, when she was at York, she joined uh, PSYOP in the student uh, section, and she actually went to a PSYOP conference. So that was, you know, I think for her, very uh, useful. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the critical incidence technique. Now, uh, this is a very powerful technique that's used by psychologists. Uh, it identifies incidences or behaviors that are necessary uh, for whatever, and usually for success, successful job performance. Uh, the technique focuses on specific activities or behaviors that lead to desirable or undesirable consequences on the job. And the goal is to have responses which indicate behaviors that separate a good from a bad performer. And it's used in IO psychology in terms of work and job analysis, that is understanding uh, what type of behaviors are needed 
for success on the job, what type of behaviors are needed for workers who uh, work in that area, for selection, such as running employment ads, uh, for performance appraisals, that is determining the criteria that you will rate employees on in terms of their performance, and also for developing tests, as we'll see in a minute. Uh, but this is a very, very flexible technique. It's been used in other areas. For example, the current American Psychological Association Ethics. It was developed beginning, uh, the beginning of its development was based on the critical incident technique, where they essentially asked people to describe their critical incidences regarding ethics, both good and bad. And one of the best things about the critical incident technique is that, that it's very simple. Uh, this is the basic form of the critical incident technique. Think of the last time you saw one of your subordinates do something that was very helpful to your group in whatever you're doing. Did this action result in a significant increase in achieving the general aim of your group? That is, whatever you're doing. And then the questions, the uh, prompts, what were the general circumstances leading up to this incident? State exactly what this person did that was so helpful. Why was this so helpful in getting the job done? When this did this incident happen? And what was this person's job? And we would, you know, either in a uh, you know interview, give these prompts, or in a questionnaire, have these uh, questions, and we'd ask people to respond to them. And you know that general form can be adapted to a lot of different situations. For example. Uh, think of the last time Dr. Ashton did something that was very useful, very helpful, excuse me, to your 253 web class in feeling comfortable working online. Did his action result in a significant increase in achieving the general aim of your group, that is, feeling comfortable working online? And this is a very valid application of the critical incident technique. And so I would ask you, what were the general circumstances leading up to this incident? Uh, state exactly what Dr. Ashton did that was so helpful. Why was this so helpful in feeling comfortable working online? And when did this incident happen? And uh, in the webinar, I asked students to take a few minutes, and I asked the uh, three or four students who were on at the time uh, to respond, and we did that. And you know, missing that is really not that critical. But another area of the critical incident technique that we can apply uh, you know, uh, the, the technique to is testing. That is, when you're developing a, a personality test or a psychological test, uh, it's important to understand the construct that you're basing the test on. And uh, the critical incident technique uh, really helps in getting uh, respondents, that is, the people that you're gearing the test towards to tell you about uh, what's important in terms of the construct you're thinking about. And so uh, I ask people, think of an in-person class you took last semester. And I want to very specifically talk about in-person classes, not online classes. And then last semester, because last semester has been completed, and I'm not going to say in the past because I wanted something very specific, you know, the most recent in your memory. Think of, the, think of the last time a fellow student did something that was very helpful to your class, uh, learn the course's material. Did his action, his or her action, excuse me, result in a significant increase in achieving the general aim of your group, that is, learning the course's material? And then what were the general circumstances leading up to this incident? State exactly what the student did, why was this so helpful, and when did the incident happen? And again, these questions are to prompt you to respond and give information. And what I'd like you to do, because I'm going to basically develop a, a you know, psychological test this semester with you, so that you can understand how they work better, and so I want, like all students, those live participating and those uh, you know, watching the recording and doing the alternative assignment, to submit your response to these four questions in the CIT Dropbox in the Assignments webinar folder. So like everyone to do this, 
uh, it's to develop the construct of this test that we're going to be developing. And I'll tell you about that after you uh, do the critical incident technique. And what we'll be doing this semester is we'll be going through the process of constructing a psychological measure. And we're going to first begin by defining the construct. And the critical incident technique can really help out here. And once we do that, then we can start talking about gar garnishing it verbally. That is by building up a good description of what the construct is. Uh, then we have to choose the right structure of the measure, that is a rating scale or a Likert scale or a force choice scale. We need to create items based on our definition back here. Uh, we need to evaluate the items on context, that is face and expert validity. Then we need to uh, you know, select the items and we're looking for items that discriminate between test takers the most, that is, that discriminate on the construct uh, the most. We need to identify similar constructs and measures, and then we have to have a validation sample. And all of these things will probably become a lot clearer to you once we get to Chapter 4 in the textbook. And then as we move throughout the rest of the semester before your final project is due, uh, we're going to go through these steps and you're going to understand how these steps are done uh, much more clearly. And one thing that you did uh, is take the uh, ONET interest profiler and as an example of what I'm talking about here, this is a validation study of the uh, uh, interest profiler. And I love this graphic here. Uh, the interest profiler is based on the Holland Interest Survey. This is a very popular and well-respected survey of uh, interests and using the idea that a person's interests may predict how much they like a certain career. And in uh, this validation survey uh, of the uh, Holland Profile and the Interest Profiler, uh, we see here uh, you know, uh, coefficient alphas and test-retest correlations. And again, in a, about uh, two weeks after we cover Chapter 4, these things will start to become understandable to you. And I ask for questions about the interest profiler. Uh, one question a student had was about the job zones, or one comment they had is about the job zones. Uh, they commented that a lot of the jobs they were seeing really wouldn't pay as much as they really hoped to. And I suspected that, that the student didn't really explore the different job zones. These are different levels of preparation and education. Uh, because in general, in our uh, economy, the more preparation you have for a job, the higher the pay. So probably based on your interests uh, and your Holland uh, score, if you would have looked at the higher job zones, you would have come across uh, jobs which had higher pay. Uh, but of course, we'll see soon uh, that uh, you know we don't have to like go with our gut feeling. We could actually look up uh, the you know normal pay or the typical pay of different jobs, and we can do that quite easily. But uh, that's going to be in a week or so. And there's Luna taking uh, like stretching out in uh, the uh, uh, shadow of the stained glass window. So she's telling us it's uh, the end of the uh, uh, webinar or the end of this recording of the webinar. And so hopefully this will uh, be enough, and it should be enough, for the people to do their alternate assignment. All right. Bye-bye.